Hello and welcome to Smart Karma's corporate webinar. I'm Sanam Nanwani from Smart Karma. This week, we are hosting Golden Every Resources. We are glad to have with us IR Director Richard Fung. We will start the webinar with Richard walking us through a company presentation, after which he will engage in a five-set chat with Smart Karma Insight Provider and this marketing coach. We are taking live Q&A, so I would like to request all our attendees to post your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. During the webinar, we will also share some links on how you can connect with Google Agri Resources and read more research by Angus. So please keep a lookout for messages in the chat box. I now hand it over to Richard to walk us through a short company presentation. Richard, please. Okay, so um, thank you for joining this presentation about Golden Agri Resources. Golden Agri is the largest uh, palm oil plantation uh, company in Indonesia, second largest in the world with a planted area of 537,000 hectares and uh, producing about uh, 3 million tons of palm products per year. Um, yeah, just some quick financials. Uh, revenue last year was over 10 billion and uh, EBITDA reached 1.2 billion and underlying profits uh, 603 million. So what you see here in front of you is the uh, flow chart of our core business in Indonesia. And you can see the vertical integration. So from, uh, from seed to shell, I think was the uh, title. And uh, it indeed starts with the production of our own uh, planting materials. Um, and then the planted area, uh, which uh, is uh, for about 80% uh, owned by Golden Agri and 20% uh, owned by um, smallholder cooperatives, but also managed by Golden Agri. Um, and uh, producing about 10 million tons of uh, FFB, fresh fruit punches, uh, the fruit of the tree that we mill in our 49 mills with a capacity of uh, 14 million tons. Um, the capacity is higher than what we produce because we also buy third party fruits. And uh, the milling capacity must also be able to keep up with the uh, high season, which is typically in the second half of the year. Uh, production last year of CPO, the crude palm oil, was 2.35 uh, uh, million tons, uh, as well as uh, 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 palm kernel, which is the seed of the fruit. The CPO is produced in our uh, is uh, processed in our refineries with a capacity of 5 million tons, and we have recently, in the last few years, also added uh, biodiesel capacity, uh, 600,000 tons uh, capacity, and the palm kernel we crush in our own uh, palm kernel crushing plants. Uh, the refineries produce, produce mostly uh, cooking oil. Uh, the biodiesel plants the, uh, the biodiesel and uh, the kernel crushing, the kernel oil and the kernel meal. The meal is used in animal feed and the kernel oil uh, we can further process in our uh, oleochemical facilities that produce uh, fatty acids and alcohols, glycerin, soap noodles. These are mostly used in cosmetics and detergents. And then finally, we also have our own uh, distribution network, international distribution network um, with um, joint ventures that allow us to um, uh, ship about 80% of our exports directly to the, uh, to the end users. So uh, some of our key strengths, uh, first one here is the, um, the uh, upstream where we uh, achieve among the highest yields in the industry. And this is uh, uh, largely due to uh, the use of technology. Uh, we have the uh, precision agriculture, um, where we uh, manage our plantations on a, on a very small scale, uh, uh, despite our size. Uh, R&D in uh, producing higher yielding seeds, mechanization to uh, enhance productivity and lower the uh, labor costs, uh, digitization, and artificial intelligence to, uh, to further enhance the, uh, the precision with, with, with which we uh, manage our estates. So this results in the, the, the center, um, center um, uh, chart, as you can see, uh, the light blue line uh, uh, indicates gold and agri's yields um, compared to the average in um, Malaysia, the orange and Indonesia in green. 
And you can see here that uh, Golden Agri consistently uh, uh, achieves yields that are well above the industry averages. Age profile is in the uh, pie chart. Um, so 15% of our trees are in their uh, young and immature uh, uh, ages. Um, and uh, that's where our growth is coming from in the coming years. As these trees mature, their yields will increase and uh, thereby our production. Um, the, uh, most of our trees are in their prime producing years, uh, about, uh, yeah, almost 65%. And uh, they create, uh, of course, a strong cash flows that we enjoy. 24% uh, of our trees are old. That means above 25, 20, uh, yeah, from 26 years old uh, onwards. Now, these trees are still uh, very high yielding. Uh, but uh, from 26 years on, we, we do start to uh, replant these trees as they become um, too tall to, uh, to harvest uh, efficiently. Um, so we have an active uh, replanting program, and uh, I'll discuss it in a moment um, uh, further down. Um, so, um, yeah, here you can see that uh, the vertical integration benefits us. Uh, becoming uh, less dependent on the um, uh, CPO price. As you can see, um, both uh, contribution from the upstream and the downstream. Next slide, please. So this slide is about sustainability. Sustainability is a important uh, topic uh, for the uh, palm oil industry. Golden Agri uh, has been a pioneer uh, for many years, and um, we have uh, taken many initiatives that have been uh, followed uh, uh, by the industry. Uh, currently, our focus is on the uh, traceability to the plantation, where we can not only um, ensure the, uh, the sustainability or you know, the, the palm oil being produced from our own plantations um, being produced sustainably, uh, but we also uh, track uh, our supply chain um, so that um, if there's any issue, then we can uh, quickly um, um, uh, track, you know, um, from where the uh, palm oil comes and whether it was produced uh, sustainably or not. And uh, this is again something that uh, Golden Agri is a is a first. So um, yeah, some other numbers uh, we we. Um, we have ourselves um, almost 80,000 hectares, which is uh, larger than the size of uh, Singapore, uh, of uh, forest high conservation uh, value and high carbon stock, meaning a lot of uh, forest uh, areas that we actively uh, preserve. And then we will also work to get together with the other um, uh, operators, suppliers to, uh, to do the same thing. So in total, I believe about 240,000 hectares we, uh, we actively participate in uh, preserving. Uh, yeah, and then uh, fire is also something that, uh, that we are very uh, aware of and um, uh, ensure that uh, you know, we, are, we are not impacted by uh, fire. Of course, we don't use uh, burning at all in terms of uh, um, um, clearing land, but uh, we also uh, have to ensure that the smaller communities surrounding our plantations are doing the same thing. So we, we work actively with them and that has resulted in uh, much less uh, uh, fire in our plantations. Next slide. So yes, just quickly, uh, technology. I already mentioned the, uh, the, um, the management information system that we uh, use to uh, manage our plantations in the very, uh, uh, sustain a very uh, precise manner. Um, we also do uh, research in the downstream to develop uh, new food products that are uh, more healthy uh, as the, uh, the requirements of the, uh, uh, of the customers continues to change. And then we also um, use um, digital technology uh, to uh, make our distribution uh, more efficient. Uh, I already mentioned the, uh, the development of our own seedlings and um, through research we have developed uh, clonal seeds that uh, yield uh, up to double uh, what we achieved in the first generation of trees. And as a result, even though um, our total planted area may not uh, uh, further expand, we will continue to see production growth as the yield from the uh, new trees will, uh, will be higher than uh, from the old trees. 
Okay, and then finally, we uh, we develop those technologies in house ourselves, but we also uh, partner with technology companies to uh, to achieve scale uh, faster. Next slide, please. Yeah, just quickly some financial strong um, strong operating cash flows as you can see. Uh, of course, helped by the um, the higher CPO prices that we have enjoyed in uh, in recent times. Uh, we have been able to continue to strengthen our balance sheet. You can see the um, financial ratios uh, improving over the years. And uh, we also enjoy a good dividend yield with 5.5% uh, last year. Okay, so this was a uh, brief presentation of the company. Um, Angus will take over from here, I believe. Yeah, well, no, thank you very much, Richard. That was uh, you know, very interesting, and and uh, you know, obviously, you know, a huge scale of operation which you're which you're running, and and uh, you know, sounds as if it 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 it's it's very efficient now, but can get uh, you know even more efficient going forward. Um, I might I might just sort of kind of start with with a, a slightly bigger picture question because uh, obviously there's there's been there's been some um, sort of recent changes in in policy, you know, from the Indonesian government regarding regarding palm oil. And I, you know, I just wondered, you know, where we are on that at the current mm -hmm. time in terms of, you know, exports and domestic market obligations and, and that kind of thing. It would be great to, to get your views on that to start with. Yeah, certainly. Well, I want to start off uh, by saying that the government is typically conducive in its policies uh, towards the uh, industry. Um, there's an important distinction uh, between, I think, uh, between the uh, uh, most other natural resources, which are very capital intensive, while uh, palm oil is very labor intensive. So what it means is that uh, while other resources are typically held by a, a few big companies uh, for palm oil uh, in um, Indonesia, um, at least 4 million people are directly employed uh, in the industry. And um, you know, indirectly uh, it could be uh, as high as uh, three times, three, three, four times as much. So it's an important uh, um, you know, voting block, you could say. And therefore, you see policies typically to be uh, very positive uh, for the industry. Uh, and I think uh, the biggest example, of course, is the biodiesel policy that has really helped to uh, support the CPO price and the farmers. Um, so this uh, this export ban that we uh, that we had for a uh, for for a period of about one month recently was uh, was unexpected. Um, it had to do with uh, yeah political pressure. Um, in that uh, there was, um, you know, the festive season was coming up, and there was not uh, enough cooking oil on the on the shelves in Indonesia because the um, international price was so high. Uh, so prices were too high, and uh, and there was not enough. So uh, the government tried a few things to uh, to bring cooking oil on the shelves, uh, which were not successful, and uh, that's why they uh, decided to temporarily uh, ban any exports. Uh, now, of course, this had a um, uh, this backfired because uh, Indonesia consumes, including the biodiesel, about only about 30 over percent of, of their own production. So uh, we, we very quickly uh, had uh, a glut and uh, especially the small farmers were unable to sell their fruits because larger buyers like ourselves, we were running out of uh, storage space. So uh, as a result, the government has, uh, has reversed the export ban and is uh, now trying to find ways to uh, to quickly um, uh, reduce the uh, excessive uh, inventories, and um, so what what this means is that uh, they um, the, the domestic market ob domestic market obligation currently is it is at uh, one over five, which means that for every uh, one ton uh, that we uh, supply domestically, we will get an export permit to supply uh, five tons through export. That ratio is going up to uh, one over seven. Uh, and um, even the one over five is already, uh, you know, is already below. Well, Golden Agri sells more domestically than uh, than the ratio uh, requires, so it's a, that's not a big thing. Um, yeah. Other than that, uh, the uh, DMO obligation and the uh, the, the domestic price obligation uh, will be reviewed regularly. Uh, as you uh, know, we have seen uh, we have seen the. Um, CPO price come down quite dramatically recently, and therefore the expectations are also that um, that uh, the export tax uh, will likely be uh, reduced rather than uh, increased. Um, another recent um, initiative is that uh, the government is considering to increase the uh, biodiesel mandate from B30 to B35, uh, also to to uh, to absorb any extra 
excess uh, capacity. So um, yeah, so all in all, uh, this was uh, unfavorable uh, to the industry. We saw very, very high prices, which uh, because of the lack of export, of course, there were other factors uh, involved as well, like the Ukrainian war, but uh, uh, these high prices um, did result in the demand destruction. And, um, you know, that, that's one of the reasons, um, you know, we, we, uh, we have seen the price come down as the uh, uh, export uh, is, is ramping up right now. Right. And, and, and the sort of, you know, the direction of, of while well, you're on the subject, the direction of, of far more prices. I mean, how do you how do you see that? And what, what do you think are the main driving factors? Because I mean, my mm -hmm. understanding is that, you know, we're, we're going into a situation where there is a, effectively a supply shortage. But you know, is that is that counteracted by a slowdown in the global economy or, you know, are there mm -hmm. other, other factors, you know, soybean and so on, which are offsetting that? Yeah. So, um, well, you know, you must realize that vegetable oils are a uh, staple, a food staple, right? So they are typically not that impacted by uh, economic cycles. Now we did see a uh, uh, significant slowdown during the pandemic, but that had more to do with logistic issues rather than underlying demand. Right. So as the um, as these uh, bottlenecks were uh, were uh, resolved, we did see the uh, consumption uh, uh, return. But at the same time, we were experiencing uh, low production for several reasons. Um, we have we had the uh, uh, La Nina uh, weather conditions, the drought, which resulted in uh, some of the uh, oil seed production to be lower, especially the uh, soybean. Uh, palm oil itself only saw a modest increase in production, um, partly because of the uh, higher un under fertilization. Uh, fertilizer prices have gone up by an average of about 60% because of the higher crude mineral prices, um, which you know primarily impacted these small smallholders, but they represent about 60% of production. So that is significant. Uh, we also see ongoing labor shortage in Malaysia, which is only resolved uh, slowly, uh, further slowing down uh, production. Uh, I already mentioned uh, Ukraine, of course. Uh, Ukraine primarily responsible for the uh, rape seed, uh, which did not come to the market uh, as expected. Um, so that, um, yeah, all in all, uh, we see um, um, improving consumption also, also on the biodiesel side because of the higher crude mineral prices. Uh, but at the same time, production uh, not uh, keeping up. So for that reason, you know, uh, we, the, 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 the current drop in price was expected, although not as fast and as aggressive as we've seen. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we've seen a reduction of about yeah, 40 to 50 percent now. Uh, in the short term, the expectation is that uh, the price will, will bounce back and uh, we still expect to end up an, of an average between uh, 11 to um, uh, 1500 for this year. Um, so definitely uh, higher prices uh, than what we've seen in, in recent years. And even at uh, where we are today at $1,000, that is still a very, very uh, attractive price um, because the uh, export tax structure in Indonesia is um, progressive. So uh, we pay less tax and uh, the, the, the net price is still around 800 US, which is uh, very, uh, very uh, positive. Right, very good. And and do you do you tend to to, to sell forward uh, on on your in terms of prices? What, what what prices do you work off generally with your sales? Yeah, we're pretty 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 close to spot. We sell everything within three months, and within that period is the 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 the, the difference difference not that big, uh, and that is actually a characteristic of the industry, uh, because as opposed to the um, seed oils, I mean, in their seed form, you can keep them for a few years, right? But uh, palm is not a seed, it's a fruit. And the fruit, first of all, needs to be, um, after harvesting, needs to be milled within 24 hours. But then even the palm oil itself uh, will deteriorate after uh, three months or so. So basically, we're, we're continuously selling. And um, that's why, um, you know, forward selling is, um, is le it's less, yeah, it's not happening yet. The, market, the, forward, the futures market beyond six months is very illiquid. Right. Yeah. Very good. Maybe we sort of go back to to kind of golden agri itself, and and uh, you know you've obviously got a huge area of, of plantation. I mean, you know, one question. I mean, obviously historically that that has been expanded, you know, relatively aggressively over the years, but obviously more recently that that has kind of stopped. I mean, you, you mentioned that you probably wouldn't be expanding the, the area, and and it would be more a focus on better yields and and uh, and replanting, I guess, as well. Um, could you give us a little bit more? sort of color on 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 that and, and yes you know. yes certainly so um uh, yeah so as i already mentioned um environmental sustainability is, is a very big topic for the industry 
and uh, I believe in 2014 we uh, already voluntarily voluntarily stopped any uh, any new organic growth uh, simply because of the risk of being accused of uh, you know um, uh, deforestation. Uh, and this is uh, something that has um, developed across the industry, um, both in uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, which represents uh, over 85% of, of global production. So there has been a, a um, fairly uh, dramatic slowdown in, in growth. Uh, the palm oil industry used to grow at high single digit rates per year. That is now down to low single digits. And um, why the, 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 the supply the, the supply demand situation is so tight is because Palm is the largest contributor to the vegetable oil complex, representing about a third. And uh, that has slowed down very much. And the competing oils, which would be the soybean, uh, rapeseed, and sunflower, they are not growing sufficiently to be able to fill that gap. And that's really where we, uh, that's really the main reason, the fundamental reason why we expect prices to be higher uh, going forward. Yeah, so, so when it comes to our production, of course, we, we want to continue to grow and we always look at MA, but. Um, um, it is not easy to find uh, quality plantations, uh, you know, up to our standards. It's, it's and it's very easy to to very sorry very difficult to uh, to turn around, um, you know, lower uh, quality plantations. So M and A, well, there's very little M and A activity in, in in the whole industry, uh, as you may know. Uh, so uh, for us, the uh, in in the upstream, the focus is really on intensification, getting more oil from the same land, and and there the potential is still very high. Uh, especially compared to, compared to the seed oils, which have gone through many, you know, many um, generations. You know, they have, they have like one, two generations per year, right? So, uh, and and uh, they've gone through genetic modification. So, so they have already been, you know, you've seen their their yields improve by orders of magnitude, right? So, um, for palm, that is a much slower process because the palm is a tree, right? So every generation takes about uh, seven years to to mature, and um, that's why so far the um, yield improvement has been um, through natural process, processes like crossbreeding, where we uh, combine the, quali the qualities of different families of seeds and, and get, get higher. Uh, uh, so we developed um, uh, a dummy seed that produces on average 20% higher that way. But uh, what we found was that through this crossbreeding, we developed uh, a, a number of uh, super trees that, which did exceptionally well and had a yield you know, um, as much as double of what we uh, previously achieved. And so, uh, through tissue culture, we have now been able to uh, genetically uh, clone these trees mm -hmm. so that we have, we can basically build a whole plantation of these uh, uh, super trees. And this still does not involve any um, genetic modification. So right. that's why I think the, the potential for production growth for palm is still very, very high. And you, you mentioned that well, the yields can be twice that of the, the, the current. Yeah, so, so what, right. current, what would be the current yield? Um, we average around uh, 45, I believe, yeah. uh, metric tons of palm per hectare per year. So that could be, uh, yeah, almost double that, almost 10, 10, 10, uh, right. 10 tons. And, 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 the, and these, these um, you know, super, super trees, um, have, you, have you actually started planting in new plant, using those trees for new plantings? Yes, that's right. So um, the thing is, uh, it takes a number of years to ramp up the, um, you know, the, 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 the seeds, the clones, but, um, but uh, you know, in the next uh, two years or so, all our new plantings should be with these new seeds. Right. Yeah, very interesting. So that, that kind of underpins a, you know, a, a much brighter, brighter future. I mean, I guess. Yeah, it I does. Mean, I guess previous plantings probably did involve you know, uh, um, enhanced trees, you know, but not, not mm -hmm. quite to the same degree as, as, as these most more recent plantings. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Um, so, I mean, the ones that we are currently replanting are our first generation. So there we can really, um, could, could, could potentially see a doubling, but uh, you are correct that uh, many of our plantations already use this, uh, this dummy seed, which was already higher, uh, higher yielding. But right. uh, but we you know this is something that uh, we think will continue and we will continue to see higher yielding uh, trees in the future. The only thing, of course, is it's a very gradual process. We we replant currently about three percent of our plantations per year. So and then it takes it takes them like seven years, right, to 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 uh, mature to reach optimal production. So so it will be so we 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 what we think we can continue to see is production uh, growth, but it will be gradual. It'll be gradual. I mean, and and you, at the same time. You know, you mentioned the the, the profile of, of your plantations in terms of different ages, and, um, and actually, it's, you know, it's a relatively 
you know, a large port, a 65% was in a, in, a, in a kind of prime production mode. Yep. And, and, and I, I would guess that, that that can sort of grow further. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, well, that, that's what we, uh, what, what we um, are doing is to, um, to ensure that uh, we will continue to see growth. You know, we, we are accelerating our replanting program. So we are currently replanting at, around, at a rate of about 15 to 20,000 hectares per year. And, and that number can easily be ramped up in the, in the coming years so that we can uh, keep a good balance between old trees and young and immature trees. Um, you know, finding the right balance between uh, good cash flows and, uh, and growth. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and interesting, I mean, the, the, the older plantations, obviously you, you mentioned that they were, they were still, you know, providing quite a decent yield, but they just get too, too, too big, too, too unwieldy to deal with in terms of the height of the trees, I guess. With the, with the sort of mechanization that you have, yeah, that becomes more more difficult. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Well, um, that's a good point actually. So that's why um, you know we the the range is twenty six to thirty, but actually we can easily uh, harvest them uh, up to thirty years old now because because change in uh, in harvesting uh, techniques. You know, so in the past we would lose because basically how the palm tree is harvested there's a, there's a a laborer really uh, with a with a long stick and a, and a knife at the end to to cut down the, the fruit. Yeah, you've seen it. Uh, yeah, I, I know. Myself. <laughs> very good. So in the past, that would be bamboo sticks, which gets which gets very heavy at uh, at higher lengths. But uh, nowadays, we can use uh, aluminum or, or other alloys, which are much lighter, right? So that already uh, helps to um, to be able to harvest the tree, you know, uh, for for a number of years longer. Right. And then uh, going forward, when we come to when it comes to mechanization, now, I have to say, I know it's one of your questions, but we might as well talk about it. Yeah. Um, uh, that uh, mechanization still has a lot of potential. It's just that we haven't really seen it in the industry. For example, in Malaysia, uh, you know, where labor is such a, uh, uh, a, an issue, um, you know, there's, there's also very little mechanization still, simply because it is uh, difficult to implement. And basically what we, what we have to, what we're now doing with our new plantations is we are planting the trees uh, a little bit differently, a little bit uh, wider apart to allow for, uh, for machinery uh, to go through. So, so we do think, I mean, right now, mechanization is primarily uh, focused on transportation of the fruits, but the actual harvesting process can be further mechanized in, uh, in the future as well. Right, I mean, are, are they using a kind of, um, is, is it a manual chopping tool or, or actually using kind of mechanized, a chainsaw type? Yeah, that's, you know, I see some, some, um, some of our peers are, are using those, but we find that they only work when the tree is very young because, because it only works when the tree is very short, because you can imagine a mechanized uh, cutter, heavy, yeah. it gets very heavy, right? So, um, but uh, of course this may change if we, if we use elevated uh, platforms. Right. So, uh, but I think this is still an uh, early stage development or oh, research. Okay, so, so, so effectively you might have a, some kind of a vehicle that went through the plantation with a, with a raised platform that you could, you know, could yeah, raise that, that's right. that's one of the things we're looking at, correct? Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, this the, 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 the mechanization could become quite expensive given that the huge areas are involved, and and um, I mean, I guess there's a sensitivity element to it as well with all the labor that's employed, you know. But it, it would still demand a lot of lot of labor. Yeah. It, it, again, it's going to be uh, it's it's just going to be a multi-decade process. I mean, um, another reason that uh, mechanization has been, never been a high priority is because labor has always been abundant in Indonesia and cheap. But um, you know, as you know, as you as you just see it in China, that's not something that will last forever, right? Um, so labor costs are, are going up. Um, we've been able to offset that with uh, production growth. Yeah. Um, but. Um, it, you know, mechanization is certainly a way to avoid, you know, um, potentially um, um, elevated labor, labor costs in the future. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that uh, as the country develops, uh, you know, people are not that keen anymore to work on the plantations. So it may also get more, actually more difficult uh, to, uh, to get uh, people uh, to work there, which, yeah, solves the sensitivity uh, in a way as well. Yeah. I mean, I just out of interest, uh, you, you pay the workers minimum wage in the, in the particular area or how oh yeah at least at least i mean by law that's the case already but uh, yeah. they typically earn more than uh, minimum wage uh, you know we, I, and you you need to attract these people to these areas right so um so generally they um the, the, the incomes are, are above uh, minimum wage plus all the all the perks that they get like we provide uh, housing on their estate we provide free schooling for the for the for their kids um free medical services and so yeah 
yeah, well, I mean, all those things are, are uh, you know, uh, um, you know, very valuable. Someone like Indonesia, where where these things are not not free, you have to pay, uh, even with yeah, or or not, or not available really. So or not, um, not available. In, in yeah. Indonesia. So uh, the, the, that's why you know when, whenever we enter an area, the whole the whole the whole neighborhood uh, or the whole the whole uh, how do you say that uh, surroundings uh, benefit uh, because of all the secondary businesses that uh, that support us that can be set up and uh, the infrastructure that we built and, and these kind of uh, facilities. So. Yeah, that's so. So what you offer here is that um, you know, uh, just a little bit about the sustainability. In the beginning, the focus was on environmental sustainability because far yeah. more companies would be deforest, cause deforestation, and you know that is very much uh, uh, not the case for 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 the larger players like ourselves. And um, this is now also very well regulated. I think that's why the industry is not uh, expanding. Uh, but the focus has shifted to the uh, social concerns, you know, where we would be taking away the livelihood of people that live in the uh, forest. And that is very difficult to quantify and regulate. And I think that is a main reason why uh, expansion has come to a standstill for the industry. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that, uh, you know, whenever we decide not to develop an area, then the lo local, local government is, is upset because, you know, it typically brings a lot of prosperity. Yeah, no, I, 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 I can, can understand that. I mean, I guess, you know, you, you, you are still expanding your, your processing capacity and, and, and uh, your milling capacity, for example. I mean, I just, mm -hmm. is, is that still an area which needs to be expanded? I mean, or, or do you have sufficient milling capacity? And, and I mean, processing yes. obviously for different types of products can, can be expanded depending on... Yes, it. milling is simply a function of, uh, of uh, the, the plantation area it serves, you know, so that, uh, that has grown gradually as our plantation uh, production has, uh, has grown. Um, refineries, that is something that we uh, made a deliberate decision uh, about, now it must be about more than five years ago already, where we uh, decided to uh, uh, fairly aggressively expand our downstream refining capacity, and that was because our upstream ha had been continuing to grow, but our downstream uh, was lagging. And uh, the problem there was that we were becoming too dependent on our off-takers, the large, uh, the large um, uh, trading companies. So in order to protect our margin in the upstream, we, we had to develop our downstream to create multiple off-take channels and, and improve our bargaining position. So that, that's, what, uh, that's what we've done. We, uh, in, a, in a matter of two, three years, we, we tripled our refining capacity to currently 5 million tons. And we believe that that is the right size um, relative to the to plantations, our own plantations, and also the third party plantations that, uh, that we buy from. So therefore we do not expect any uh, big expansion or CapEx program in terms of uh, refining capacity expansion. We are focusing on specialty products um, like biodiesel, like oleochemicals, uh, but they are less capital intensive because the volumes are much uh, lower. Yeah, right. So, so I mean, I, you mentioned earlier you you, you were processing, you know, third party uh, um, product product as well as as well as your own. And I mean, I guess, yeah. but you so, so you're 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 working at sort of quite high levels of of capacity utilization as a result of that. Yes, exactly. So uh, the ben so as I mentioned uh, uh, already, that uh, there's a lot of smallholders surrounding our plantations, yeah. and uh, they typically do not have the they don't have their own milling, uh, they don't have their uh, distribution network, right? So we can leverage our own logistics by by merchandising uh, their products, basically. So uh, and that is quite significant because um, uh, we produce about three million tons of palm product, but we sell about nine million. So two thirds of our sales volume is actually coming from uh, third parties. And that is why this uh, traceability to the plantation is also such an important uh, initiative for us. Right, so, so it's actually a very big number that, that uh, the third party uh, processing that you're doing. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and, and so you could just explain probably for the benefit of, 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 of those who, who haven't looked at the industry for, for long or, or, or in any great depth and the, the, the difference with the plasma in your in your plantations yes well, so earlier i mentioned that uh, about 80 percent is nucleus which is owned by golden agri and 20 percent is owned by corporatives the, the plasma so this is a government mandated program where we uh, we compensate the people that live in the areas that we develop by um, allowing them to uh, to develop a few hectares maybe two two to four hectares per family uh, by themselves and then um, and then they sell the fruits Basically, they get a loan and they, they pay back the loan by selling the fruits to Golden Agri um, to, uh, through a, a formula set by the government. Right. So um, 
for Golden Agri, we actively uh, manage the plantations of these um, of these um, smallholders in the same way that we um, manage our company-owned plantations. Therefore, there is no difference in yield. Right. Um, the big difference is, of course, the profit margin, mm -hmm. uh, because um, most of the upside on the CPO price goes to the smallholder because of the formula. So we make a I mean, on our own, we can make up to 40% margin for, uh, from our own plantations. Um, for the, um, the plasma, it is around 10%, uh, also called uh, a milling margin. Basically, we, we, we earn by, by buying their fruits and, and milling them into uh, CPL. Right. But that, that, that's, you know, I mean, it's supporting, again, an, another way you're, you're really supporting the local community, which is, which is, which is pretty important. Yeah. Um, um, and just in, in terms of, you know, I mean, the, the sort of demand drivers, I mean, you, you, you obviously you've mentioned biodiesel, which, which, you know, could go on, uh, and maybe we'll talk about that next, but other than biodiesel, you know, where are the sort of main drivers globally uh -huh. for, for demand in terms of products? And right, right. Actually, which, which geographies are you seeing, you know, the greatest sort of demand from? Yeah, so um, most of the growth over the past uh, uh, decades has been coming from the large developing economies, uh, India, China, uh, Indonesia itself, uh, Pakistan. Um, but at the same time, we've also been seeing growth from uh, Europe um, and uh, the US, um, although US from a smaller base, but uh, in Europe also for the, um, the biodiesel. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, so that's in terms of uh, geography. Um, so the largest would be uh, India and then, oh no, the largest would be actually be Indonesia now because of the biodiesel, yeah. and then India, uh, China, Europe, Pakistan, in that, uh, in that order. Um, in terms of um, the products, of course, most of it is still used for food. Um, I think at about 70 over percent or so is, uh, is for food. And um, yeah, this was mostly cooking oil, cooking oil margarine. Um, but uh, we, we are trying to move up, you know, the value chain um, by um, producing um, more customized products rather than just bulk oil. Um, I mentioned that we have our own distribution. Now, in the past, we would sell to the traders who are just buying the bulk, right, uh, or, or crude. Now we, we, we talk directly to end users and we can customize our product uh, according to their requirements in terms of quality, specifications, uh, sustainability certification, and uh, by more closely matching their requirements, we can improve our margins. Um, so, so um, yeah, so, yeah, I think it's more that we are moving to higher quality products, like healthier products. Yeah. Um, those are the kind of things where we, uh, we, we see growth. Uh, then, um, yeah, the biodiesel, uh, of course, continues to grow. We are uh, further increasing our uh, refining capacity based on the uh, Indonesian uh, biodiesel mandate. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, third would be uh, oleochemicals. Um, although this is, uh, yeah, more of a niche, lower volume uh, business. But it's a low, low volume, but, but, but possibly, you know, more, more refined given that they're being used in- Higher margin, obviously, yes. Cosmetics and soaps and, and all that kind of thing. Correct, um, yes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, you know, obviously, you know, palm oil is, is you know, often it's as a, as, a, as a cooking oil, it's regarded as being relatively unhealthy, but I'm not, I'm not sure if that's necessarily the case, if it's been, been refined. Yes, well, um, uh, and the same can be said, I mean, okay, so um, just to be um, blunt about it, I mean, the, the fact is that uh, palm oil, as I mentioned, is the most consumed edible oil in the world. It's competing directly with the uh, oil seeds, that I, uh, the seed oils that I mentioned. Yeah. And uh, the, the issue uh, is that uh, over 85% of palm oil is coming out of two, you know, yeah. remote countries, Indonesia, Malaysia. I, I mean, from a Western perspective, right? While the, uh, the sunflower, the, the, the soybean, the rapeseed, that's, that's all grown in Western economy. So uh, palm is always competing as it is the cheapest oil. And that's primarily because of its much higher yield, five to seven times higher yield per hectare. Right, uh, so palm is always the cheapest competing with these Western oils, and that's why, uh, you know, it's it's an e easy target. Um, yeah. So, um, for example, um, you already mentioned the health concern, and uh, the belief among most people, I believe, is still that uh, 
tropical oils, including palm oil, would be bad for your health because of the um, uh, saturated fats, which, uh, which can cause a heart attack. However, the uh, medical consensus for a long time has already has been that uh, trans fat is, is a much bigger health concern than uh, saturated fats. And that's why you see this mandatory labeling in the US. And um, you see companies like uh, McDonald's shifting from soybean to palm oil to lower the trans fat content in their products. Because the irony is that palm oil in almost every application has zero trans fat. While the, uh, the seed oils that I mentioned, they all have to go through a process called hydrogenation to mm -hmm. make them stable, which, which creates the trans fat. So, uh, so this whole discussion is, uh, is very uh, questionable, but uh, yeah, the effectiveness of the Western uh, you know, media machine uh, shows that uh, the people's perception is still that palm oil would be bad for your health. Well, uh, and I would say, uh, to some extent, the same for the uh, sustainability uh, arguments. You know, as, uh, for 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 many many years, uh, soybean has been a much higher um, contributor to, to deforestation than uh, than palm oil has. You know, at, at least three times as much, right? Uh, but if you if you ask the, the man on the street, it's still palm oil. When, when it comes to deforestation, palm oil is typically the the, the first thing that. Uh, that's on top of mind, basically. So, uh, so those are the same kind of things that uh, we continuously have to uh, fight. And uh, yeah, like I said, um, uh, because it's it's only two countries that uh, are producing this primarily, um, it's it's an uphill battle, unfortunately. Yeah, no, understood. I mean, often there's there's, there's, a, there's a misunderstanding of these. In fact, I heard that um, that red palm oil, you know, the pure, the red colored uh, virgin palm oil, if you like, is actually very healthy. You know, it's even know. healthier that's right than the refined products but people exactly. always but the, the premium product is always the refined product because it looks cleaner exactly yeah, no, actually, yeah. i have tasted the the uh the, the virgin palm oil didn't i see i see all right um, Very good. so just to move on you meant you've mentioned biodiesel and i'm just sort of wondering you know obviously we, we've got to a stage that we're at b30 now you know they're talking about b35 but i mean how much further can, can the envelope be pushed in terms of the, the um, you know, the palm oil content in, in, in diesel? You know, yes. when, when does it stop becoming a, a, a possibility to use any more biodiesel? Okay, well, the, the government is now um, road testing B40 uh, yeah. because there is a potential issue with the engines not being able to, to take the uh, higher levels of, uh, of blending. Uh, but uh, B40 uh, could still be uh, possible. But uh, actually, the government would like to move to uh, B100 if, uh, if possible. And technically, that's absolutely possible. There's a process called uh, hydro cracking, which um, uh, turns the um, palm oil into, um, into a very refined oil that uh, any engine can take. The only problem is it's, uh, it, it's still very capital intensive you know, to, uh, yeah. to, to build that. But you see in the US, for example, you see the uh, HVO, uh, hydro treated vegetable oil. That's like um, green biodiesel, they call it, I think, is, uh, is, is, is growing rapidly. And um, you know, this certainly helps the vegetable oils, including uh, palm oil. So there's still a lot of uh, potential there, but at the same time, um, you know, I mean, we're already with B35, I think almost nine to 10 million tons would be would be absorbed right well indonesia produces about 45 million tons right so that's already like 20 over percent which is significant mm -hmm. so um i think i think uh, the biodiesel um can definitely um ensure that there's no overcapacity. but you know there's always this uh, food for fuel discussion as well right so um so it can it can go both ways i think yeah, but I mean, again, so I mean, the message is that, that, that it can be, you know, continuing, you know. It can, yes, it can, yeah. And uh, provide, in theory, it can, absolutely. Yeah, uh, provide, a, provide a, at least a, a sort of, you know, a, a baseline cushion, if you like, to, to demand. Yes, yes, and not, and not just in Indonesia, uh, of course, also in the Western economies, because um, just to be clear, biodiesel policies are not set up because they are more environmentally friendly or because they make economic sense, but because... Uh, they make political sense. You know, they are primarily uh, designed to support the, the farmers in the domestic, in the respective domestic uh, um, yeah. environments, right? So, for example, in the US, it would be very much for the soybean. In, in Europe, it would be very much for the for the rapeseed. Mm -hmm. 
um, and um, and it's actually Indonesia is a latecomer developing its own uh, biodiesel policies, biodiesel policies specifically to support uh, palm oil. Right. Very good. Well, we're, we're sort of running, you know, closer close to, to, to the end of time. Being very very interesting. Well, just just one in terms of sort of the you know the the the, the outlook, um, your sort of capex plans, and you know what is your kind of view on 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 the on, on the next year or so and, and, and for the industry and, and for, for Golden Agri? Okay, um, so that's a few great questions in one. So, uh, so in terms of the production growth, I think that's one of your questions. Yeah, um, yeah we, see, uh, we see modest growth this year. Um, we, um, we expect uh, the industry uh, both, well, in May, Malaysia may actually come out lower, but um, Indonesia, we still see uh, up to 5%, four, four, up to 4% growth or so. Uh, and Golden Agri also around uh, 4 or 5% mm -hmm. uh, for this year. Uh, and then going forward, yeah, on every, I mean, as you know, it, it very much depends on, on weather conditions. Yeah. Um, but uh, on average, uh, low single digit is what uh, we expect to continue to see for the uh, palm oil uh, industry. Um, and then, oh, your, your question in terms of capex. So our capex budget, yeah, used to be like half a million US when uh, first when we were building our upstream aggressively, then when we were expanding our downstream refining. Uh, but uh, that has completed, and since that time, our capex budget has come down to about two hundred million a year, uh, of which one hundred million is for the upstream, mostly for the replanting, and one one hundred million for the downstream, uh, for some of our you know, ancillary uh, uh, downstream um, facilities, uh, for example, the uh, biodiesel um, plant expansion that we're working yeah. on right now. So uh, we expect to remain around this uh, 200 million, up to 200 million level for the, uh, for the coming years. Right. Very good. And, and, and it sounds as if you're still relatively, you know, despite the, the recent sort of pullback in the palm oil price, I mean, the, 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 the longer term trend for the price is relatively, you know, firm at these kind of levels. Um, yeah, so we're very confident about that, and uh, that should uh, bode well for the uh, performance of the company. Interesting. Well, Richard, you know, that, 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 that's great. Uh, this juncture, I'll say thank you very much. Very interesting uh, discussion. I'm sure we could, we could talk on for, for a lot longer. Um, I'm going to now hand, hand back to, to Sanam to, to make some closing remarks. Thanks very Thanks. much. Thanks, Angus. Thank you, Angus, for some very interesting questions. Also, big thanks to Richard for a detailed insight into Golden Agri Resources the challenges in the palm oil industry, and opportunity for Golden Agri. I would also like to thank our attendees for joining the session live. And uh, I hope uh, everyone enjoyed the session. With this, I would like to wrap up this week's corporate webinar. Thank you so much again, and have a great week ahead. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.